Welcome to this worship experience here at First Lutheran Church in Blair, Nebraska. I'm Pastor Scott Fredrickson, and I'm glad you can join us as we look into the life of Jesus in Nazareth. During this season of Epiphany, there are many ways in which you might be able to create for yourself a, a worship area, whether it's at your home or uh, perhaps in your bedroom or your office or wherever you're participating in these videos. If you have some water available, Epiphany uh, starts with the baptism of Jesus, and it may be helpful to have a bowl of water or even a glass of water to remind you of your own baptism and the relationship God has established with you in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Epiphany is also the season of light, and candles such as these may also help enhance your worship experience. To light a candle and to remember the presence of God in our lives, to clear away that which is murky and cloudy, and to bring clarity and truth to all that we do. And finally, know that this particular worship experience concludes with Holy Communion. And if you have bread and wine or grape juice and a cracker as a way to participate uh, in this grand communal meal with Christians all across the globe, to be able to celebrate the presence of Christ in our lives. So we invite you to sit back and relax, take a deep breath as we begin our worship. Thanks for being with us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. 
bring wholeness to all that is broken, and speak truth to us in our confusion, that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Good morning and welcome to our children's message. I want you to think about a habit that you have. Is there something that you do on a certain day every week? So for example, I go into the church kitchen here every single Wednesday and I work with some other people to make our midweek meal. That's a habit I have. I do it every single Wednesday. Now I'm going to read from the book of Mark, today's gospel story, and it tells us about a habit that Jesus has. Chapter 1, verse 21. Jesus and his followers went to Capernaum. On the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at Jesus' teaching because he taught like a person who had authority, not like their teachers of the law. So when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. Do you know what a synagogue is? You've probably heard that word. A synagogue is a place where Jewish worshipers gather together to pray and sing songs to God, just like we gather in a church. A worship gathering occurs at least once every week, usually on the day called the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is a holy day of rest that is different from all the other days of the week. And for Jewish people, their Sabbath day begins at sundown on Friday night, and it goes until sundown on Saturday night. The Sabbath day for a Christian is often Sunday, but it could be any day that you choose. So in each of these faith traditions, both for Jews and for Christians, the Sabbath is a day to rest from working and to focus on worshiping God by reading and hearing God's stories, by praying, by singing songs to God. And it's also a time to rest from our busy lives. It's a time to take care of ourselves and a time to thank God and say prayers to him for things that we need or things that we're thankful for and to pray for others. So we know from this story and other Bible stories that Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, which is a teacher. And when he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, he taught people about God and helped them understand how God wanted them to live. What do you think Jesus was teaching about that day in the synagogue? Do you wonder what kinds of things he might have said? It was a very long time ago. Well, today's story doesn't tell us what he said. But other Bible stories tell us some of the things that Jesus taught. To love God, to love each other by making sure that everybody has what they need to live and thrive. When we share what we have until everyone has enough of food, of clothes, of shelter, of love, we are working for justice. 
And Jesus taught that in his synagogue all those many years ago. And he still teaches us that today because we learn those things when we read his stories in the Bible. So this week, I want you to think about what Jesus might have taught long, long ago in a synagogue and what he still is teaching us when we read our Bible stories and we learn about things from church and we sing songs and we pray. Remember that Jesus was a teacher way, way back, but he is still our teacher even today. Let's pray. Dear God, help us follow Jesus' example by building healthy habits, such as praying, reading the Bible, gathering for worship, caring for ourselves, loving our neighbors, and working for justice around the world. Amen. That's it for today. I hope you guys have a great week. I will be back tomorrow with a Bible lesson recording, and then I'll be back again on Thursday with a creative activity. Take care and take care of your neighbors. Love you all. Holy Gospel comes from St. Mark in the first chapter. Mark writes, So they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. Now they, that's the folks at the synagogue, were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. And just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing the man into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching, with authority? 
He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. I love this story from the Gospel of Mark here. Jesus comes into the synagogue and as he's doing his teaching, they notice that it's different. They notice that he teaches as one having authority, not as a scribe. In other words, Jesus seems to be speaking from, from another level or another place than what is normally taught there in the synagogue. However, that's not the story that really impresses them. It turns out that as Jesus is teaching, as one who has authority, there happens to be a man who is possessed by a demon. And this demon begins to speak to Jesus, saying, I know who you are, the Holy One of Israel. And in knowing who Jesus is, he asks, what have you come to do with us? And Jesus casts this demon out of this man. And then the crowd in the synagogue is truly amazed because now they're wondering, what is this? What's going on that this demon has been cast out from this man? Who is this Jesus of Nazareth teaching in our synagogue? And it's a great story. And it does a lot to show you and I who hear the story 2,000 years later uh, how important it is that Jesus seems to have immediate connection to the spiritual truths and realities of the world. So that this demon that, that sort of lives in this uh, shadow netherland that you and I call spirituality, this demon immediately recognizes Jesus as a threat. And Jesus doing what Jesus does uh, takes care of the threat and, and, and eliminates it uh, from this particular man by casting the demon from him. However, I wonder, I wonder if at that particular moment that was really what the story was all about. Oh, I know that by the time it's written in the Gospel of Mark and by the time you and I read it, the story is about Jesus. But what about the man? What about the man who had the demon cast out from him? Now, there's no mention of him. They don't say that he was resting. They don't say anything about him at all. It's all about Jesus, as rightly so. It is, after all, his gospel, not some unnamed man who once had Jesus cast a demon out from him while he was in the middle of the synagogue on one Saturday morning. But nonetheless, there was a man there. There was a man who Jesus healed, who casted out the demon. And that's important to remember because if you heard the lesson from Deuteronomy that was read earlier in this service, you'll hear that the Jewish tradition has been waiting a long time for someone to come and speak the words of God, to speak the words that God will give them. And what's happening in this particular story in the Gospel of Mark is we have this strange event where, where Jesus is entering uh, into this synagogue and the words of God are being spoken and, 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 and somehow this miasma or concatenation of relationship between this man, this demon, and Jesus, people hear the word and the power of God. And in the casting out of this demon, not only does Jesus elevate in his authority and in the wonderment of the people who are there, but he also literally cures and heals a man. Now, I know in our day and age, it is not real popular to, to talk about evil and demons as if they are real realities in the same way that a cheeseburger is a reality or the same way that, you know, a sporting event is a reality or something like that. We like to uh, psychologize our particular demons and evils. And in fact, for those of us who live in the Lutheran tradition, one of the most famous people to do that was Martin Luther himself. Martin Luther had a tendency when he was talking about evil or sin uh, to immediately make it uh, somewhat more psychological than many had done before. Because you see, for people like Jesus and for many of the people even in Luther's time, 1,500 years later, uh, evil was a, was a present reality and not all that much different than a cheeseburger or a sporting event. It was something that had to be dealt with because there was literally evil walking, wandering around in this shadow netherworld. 
So when Jesus enters into the synagogue and, and cures this man of his demon, there, there's a reality that is being uh, witnessed there. And, and we might gloss over it because we don't particularly believe in demons or have any reason to believe in demons. After all, they're, they're not really tangible or fungible in our lives. So we just kind of assume they really don't exist like we do with most things that don't have uh, any kind of way we can taste or touch or see or smell them. But there are realities out there, obviously, that, that exist beyond the realm of our senses. And it's those realities beyond the realm of our senses that Jesus is dealing with in this story when he goes to talk to the man uh, in the synagogue and cure him of the demon. Now, if you've looked around over the last few months as we've lived through this COVID pandemic, for many people, of course, percentage-wise, you may not have personally caught COVID-19. Some of you may have, and depending on the severity of your particular case or the dose that you received, uh, you may have gotten sick. Unfortunately, for some in our particular community, they've received a lethal dose and have died from COVID-19. But regardless of whether you've personally experienced COVID-19 or not, whether your own lungs have been racked with this virus, it does exist. But here's the thing, unless you have a very powerful microscope, you can't see it. And because you can't see it, sometimes we think it doesn't exist. And because we think it doesn't exist, we begin to live as if it doesn't exist. But the reality is, is that COVID-19 does exist. And it exists beyond what we can normally just taste or see, touch, feel, or smell. And because it exists beyond the realm of our senses for so many of us, we can begin to, to get lax about that reality of COVID-19. The same laxness, perhaps, that was in that synagogue that morning when Jesus entered it. I mean, these people apparently were nonplussed that this man was here who had a demon. They knew he had a demon, yet he was there in the synagogue. They hadn't ostracized him. They hadn't kicked him out. In fact, they'd invited him into his, their community with the demon. And then when the demon is cured, they're not so much worried about the man and the demon that he lost as, as they are impressed with Jesus and his ability to cast it out. So when we talk about COVID-19, we must remember that for us, even though we can't experience it, it's playing on our reality. It's, it's impacting the way in which we live and move. And it's not just because we can't go to theaters or bars or restaurants. It's not just because I have to video these sermons rather than uh, preach them live in front of a congregation. But it is a reality that affects all that we're doing. And even if we're saying that we don't believe in it or that we somehow don't want it to affect our reality. In other words, we say, all right, I can't see COVID. I can't touch it. I don't have it. I'm just going to pretend that it doesn't exist it still impacts our larger society and our larger world. In fact, that's what's so distressing about COVID-19. For many people, especially here, not, not only in Nebraska, but in the middle part of the country and for the United States in general, COVID-19 has had a disastrous effect on about 450,000 people and they've died. And that's a tragedy. And perhaps that number could have been a lot less if we'd taken it seriously early on. But also know this, across the globe and across the world, COVID has ruined economies, it's kept nations at bay, it's done an incredible amount of damage to sometimes the most vulnerable people on the planet. Not the most vulnerable people in our neighborhood, not necessarily the most vulnerable people in your house, but on our planet. And it's this understanding of COVID-19 that we have to have if we're gonna ever understand the reason that Jesus heals the man in the synagogue. He doesn't cure the man in the synagogue because he's somehow worried that this guy is going to disrupt his sermon. He doesn't cure the man in the, the synagogue because this demon uh, has somehow, you know, angered him. In fact, Jesus doesn't even initiate the conversation. It's the demon that initiates the conversation, worried that Jesus is going to do something. You see, when we're talking about COVID-19, it is going to come and attack. And it's going to be there sometimes when we're least expecting it. And that's the reason why so many people still wear masks or social distancing. That's why so many people are getting the vaccine. Not because they, they somehow think that they're gonna be saved from COVID-19, 
but because they want to put a, their line in the sand, so to speak, against this invisible threat, this invisible evil. And when it comes to us and says, what do you have to do with us? We can say, well, I'm vaccinated, or I'm wearing a mask, or I'm social distance, or whatever your particular uh, defense is. The power and promise of God is that we are going to be loved by God beyond our wildest imagination. But that promise exists in a world in which God understands that evil will come and attack us. That there will be things that we cannot see, that there will be places and events and viruses and everything else that is going to try to infect our world. And it's going to try to infect our world and get us to lead away from what is God has called us to do, to be people of love, to be people of hope, to be people who share, to be people of equality, to be people who can stand together arm in arm regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of your sexual orientation, regardless of your, the amount of money you make or don't make, that all of us can be bound together in God's love and God's hope. And as those invisible evils begin to attack us, we may begin to lose hope. We may begin to lose faith. And that's perhaps the last thing we can understand from this story of the synagogue and Jesus there. I mean, by the time those people have participated in that synagogue, they've been hearing those words of Moses from Deuteronomy for almost 1,500 years at least, if not longer. And they have been waiting a long time for their prophet to come and speak the words of God. And it is in the process of Jesus healing that man, exercising that demon, casting out that evil, that they begin to see that perhaps those words of Deuteronomy are starting to come to fruition. And as you and I continue to stand together and battle this invisible disease of COVID-19, it is as we begin to stand together in our masks, socially distant, as close as we are allowed to be in order to stay safe that we too begin to live into the reality and see the promise of God made real in our lives, that we are bound together behind all those masks, that we are bound together even though we're six feet apart, that we are bound together even though we cannot sing a hymn in a congregation. Because what binds us is not our hymn singing or our faces or our proximity to each other. What binds us is the love of God that is another invisible reality. The love of God that is invisible and is in all of our hearts and minds and bodies uniting us not only across this congregation, not only in this city, not only in this state, but in this globe and in this universe. And it's that power of God's love that we celebrate. It's that power that exercises the demons from our lives and allows us to stand back and say, wow, what happened here? And if that story of the synagogue is any indication of what happened here, when all is said and done, when COVID-19 finally begins to recede back uh, from its vicious uh, cruelty that is inflicted upon us to this day, when it finally goes back into hiding and the vaccines or the masks or whatever it is that we use find a way to keep it at bay, chances are we're going to look around and see that somewhere there's Jesus. Somewhere there's Jesus who provided us with hope, who provided us with love, who actually provided us with the strength as the demon is cast away. That is the story of the Jesus at the synagogue. Thanks for being with us. Amen.
Today we pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Let us pray. We pray, God, for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, those who are living with HIV or AIDS, those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry or homeless, and any and all in need, especially those who are suffering from the effects of COVID-19. And we pray for caregivers and hospice workers and home health aides and all those who continue to seek to offer us health and care. Let us take a few moments of silence to remember those who bring a special need before God on this day and to offer thanks and gratitude for those who continue to find ways that we can live together in healthy and safe ways. Let us pray. Have mercy on us, O God. We pray for the concerns of this congregation. We pray for those who travel, those who long to be together in person for worship, those who are celebrating birthdays or anniversaries. We pray for the people of God in this place and for all the needs of our community, especially those who seek food or shelter. We pray for our annual meeting and as we gather to discern uh, our ministry in your mission. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. And God, we pray for the covenant you made with us in the waters of baptism. We give thanks for those who have been baptized and have died in you. Especially on this week, we remember Pastor Jim McBride, and we remember Shirley Rick, and all those who have died in your care. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. And so, merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now, at this time, we traditionally receive an offering for the ministries of this congregation. And for those of you who are able, we invite you to contribute uh, not only to the ministries here at First Lutheran Church, but to any particular ministry that has a place upon your heart, whether it's here in the community or perhaps globally. Please note that during the month of February, our congregation is having a Have of Heart campaign for the Washington County Food Bank at Joseph's Coat. And so we ask if you're able to make a contribution to the food pantry at this time, whether in food or monetary value, that would be greatly appreciated. And also note that on Saturday, February 6th, from nine in the morning till one in the afternoon, our members of our congregation will be outside of the Family Fair grocery store here in Blair with a list of items that you might be able to pick up to help those at Joseph's Coat. So we invite you to take a look at that and to see if that particular ministry lays upon your heart. And there is another opportunity as well as the women of our congregation are beginning to gather together health kits for Lutheran World Relief. These health kits involve various toiletry and uh, sundry items that can help people stay healthy throughout this world and are distributed by one of our great ministry partners, Lutheran World Relief. So we invite you to check online for a list of items that go into those health kits and if you can make a donation to those, the women of our congregation would greatly appreciate it. And then also note that the weekend of February 6th and 7th, we will be going back to in-person worship. But we'll still have many of our uh, social uh, distance and mask uh, protocols, but we will not be asking for pre-registration at this time. So if the Holy Spirit is upon you and you'd like to join us in person here at the Life Center, Saturday evening, February 6th at six o'clock, or Sunday, February 7th at uh, 9.30, we invite you to join us. So have a great uh, week, and we thank you for being with us. We prepare our hearts and minds for Holy Communion. Let us pray. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, 
gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat from this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. And so now let us pray together the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ is given for you. The blood of Christ is shed for you.
And now may the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and always. Amen. And so let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet nourished in body and in spirit to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. I invite you to receive the benediction. And as we go out into this week, may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine on us and be gracious to us. May the Lord's holy countenance smile down upon us all and give us peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us. Have a great week and go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.